It's been exactly one week since the Pulwama attack, which resulted in the deaths of uh, nearly 40 uh, CRP personnel uh, traveling from Pulwama to uh, their camps in other parts of Kashmir. And uh, I have with me Prem Mahadevan. He is a researcher in um, terrorism. Uh, he used to be with the Swiss Institute of Federal Technology until fairly recently, and has authored a number of books on terrorism, including the most recent one, uh, Islamism and Intelligence, that, which I think was released sometime, published sometime last uh, last year. Um, Mahadevan, welcome to this interview with uh, Strategic News International. Um, you know, you have the luxury of distance. You're a uh, little far off, sitting in Switzerland, looking at how things are working out here. Uh, how do you see this uh, attack? Uh, in, I mean, what is your sense of what's going on here? Uh, thank you. Thank you for calling me. Um, first of all, I would see this attack as a perverse way of Pakistan trying to return the India-Pakistan dynamic to a state of normalcy. And normalcy is pretty much their definition of it. Um, normalization, as far as Pakistan is concerned, is that they can carry out terrorist attacks in India, ask for proof, always insist that whatever proof is provided is inadequate and circumstantial, and then demand dialogue in order to basically negotiate from a position of strength. After Mumbai, Pakistan was under severe international pressure not to allow another attack by lashkar e -Taiba. And uh, Pakistan's fiction that LET was a rogue, non-state actor was not really accepted in the international diplomatic community. And Pakistan itself undermined that, that discourse by then allowing LET through political proxies to try to run for office last year, for political office. So now I think Pakistan has gauged that enough time has passed since Mumbai, it can start ratcheting up the tension again and it, in effect return to business as normal. And that is how I see this attack. It is in some ways a continuation of Pakistan's long-standing proxy war. The, uh, there's a lot of speculation here about uh, the return of the Jesh, if you want to call it that, uh, that the that Pakistan is now kind of put the lashkar e tayyaba on hold and is now giving more uh, encouragement to the Jesh to carry out these attacks. Is that your sense? I would agree. Um, as I said, LET has become too, too politically exposed as far as Pakistan is concerned at the international level. Uh, I find that quite a few government, European government officials whom I've spoken with know about LET in, in the kind of detail that one would not normally expect of uninvolved countries. And that's because they studied LET after Mumbai. They've understood the origins of this group. They know it's a Pakistani group, not a Kashmiri one. They know it's fully under the control of the ISI. So if an attack were to be carried out by LET, and even if it were, like say, the, the Mumbai attacks were not originally claimed by LET, the, it was a non-existent group called the Deccan Mujahideen, which claimed responsibility. It was only some time later that LET owned up to this attack. So the Pakistanis know that any attack that has an LET signature is going to lead to them coming under international pressure. Jesh, on the other hand, offers them a certain amount of deniability. They can always turn around and say, look, we were attacked by Jaish. There are our enemies as well. There is no proof against them. And it's it's basically a new name uh, for Pakistan to pursue its old policy. So I agree. I think that uh, this is a matter of reflagging, if you like. You know, in um, for instance, in maritime, uh, in illegal fishing, sometimes a ship will just change its flag, its flag of convenience, and move to an, uh, another country, another ship registry, but it will essentially keep doing the same thing. This is what we've got. Pakistan is continuing with its proxy war, but just fronting another organization for it. Is it also a signal that uh, the Pakistani deep state has kind of uh, been uh, reading Modi for a while and decided that uh, perhaps he may not be very different from the kind of uh, leaders we've had in the past who've been accused of being weak and less than, uh, you know, uh, tough to Pakistan's constant uh, terror strikes and uh, related uh, uh, actions? My own understanding is that um, the deep state got an estimate or that the India-Pakistan uh, equation, if you like, is not is not really driven by personalities when it comes to hard policies. It's driven by personalities when it comes to soft policies. So, for instance, uh, the period 
say between 2004 or rather we can even go back we can say take it say from 2001 onwards the agra summit and there there on there was an effort irrespective of personalities from india to try and reach out to pakistan uh, we could even go back to lahore 99 the thing is that during the period of 2004 to 8 there was a lot of emphasis on india's part that we really felt a strong and stable pakistan is in our interest uh, that quote was quite popular at the time it sounds bizarre now that anyone could say a strong and stable enemy is in their interest but there was a lot of effort being made um, by intellectuals in india and also by the by western countries not least the united states to persuade us that we had a common enemy with pakistan in terrorism and that effectively uh, we we should work together with pakistan this was before things like crimea happened uh, making the west itself realize that there there can in fact be state sponsorship of whatever militants insurgency um, you know the 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 russia ukraine war and then what's happening now in the middle east so our soft policy towards pakistan was very much personality dependent between 2004 and 8 but our hard policy towards pakistan has not really been that hard it's more been self defense and we've been rather consistent in that i think the deep state understands that we are essentially quite consistent when it comes to protecting ourselves and that the limits of what we would do are a fairly well delineated we will not for instance kill pakistani civilians we can easily do a mumbai on them there is nothing operationally stopping it um but they calculate that we would just not do it because we are worried about international opinion and they feel they can get away with these kinds of attacks better because they are a smaller country and they they've just perfected the discourse of disinformation whereas we tend to adopt a more synchronized whole of government approach we want our diplomacy to match what we're actually doing so i think the deep state wasn't really intimidated by mr modi to begin with they were more worried about the international fallout now with afghanistan with the us looking for a way out of afghanistan and with domestic militancy in pakistan having substantially dropped from the previous years and it has been consistently dropping i think the the deep state feels there is now less opportunity uh for india to hit back at them covertly uh if if we ever did hit back in the first place and furthermore they feel that they are winning essentially in afghanistan so this is a statement of uh, boldness on their part no in one of your um, former books that you have written uh, i believe it was for the indian army on the whole um, thing about surgical strikes uh, to as a response to cross border terror um there's a lot of speculation going around that uh, some kind of a retaliatory action by india may be in the offing um given the fact that we already done a surgical strike uh, you think it's um, feasible to carry out another and what's your sense what is the sense you get my sense is that uh, tactical operations can um, can always be carried out it's a matter of choosing the time and place which is best left to the professionals with regard to with regard to actually carrying out an overt strike which is what the surgical strikes were they were claimed by us i would suggest that it's often better to inflict pain covertly on the pakistanis because our diplomacy is really doing a lot of a lot of good work at this stage you know one thing about pakistan is consistently ever since the 1993 um, bombings in mumbai pakistan wants to behave like a rogue but they don't want to be called one especially now that the international level and some of their own journalists in the mid 90s observed this that there is this tension in pakistan's policy it wants to basically act like a rogue state but still be treated like a respectable one we can uh, we can afford to compromise them by highlighting their i mean the fact that for instance they haven't banned uh, jamaat ud dawa despite pledging they would do so uh, in 2008 these are the kind of inconsistencies that our diplomats can expose now an overt surgical strike if if we decide to carry it out then of course the government would had take all factors into consideration but striking covertly could also send a, a painful message to pakistan and make it clear that these attacks have consequences which they cannot fully uh, anticipate and bear the cost of 
And yet it would give us space to continue with our proactive diplomacy uh, to isolate them and at, le at the very least uh, expose them. So some of this speculation is also about, um, you know, uh, the wisdom does it make any sense to strike at terror camps, given that these are really very small locations, you know, and wouldn't it make more sense to perhaps target the Pakistani military directly? Yes, I um, what the Pakistani military fears is not attacks on civilians. Uh, and at the end of the day, even the jihadis that it trains and equips and funds, even these guys are eventually civilians. What it fears is a domestic political humiliation. Something, for instance, uh, on par with, well, Abbottabad is a different matter. That's a whole different level of sophistication. But even, say, the attacks which took place on the army general headquarters or naval base in Karachi, this is the kind of stuff that the Pakistanis are, the Pakistani army is really afraid of because it makes them look stupid. It shows that um, despite eating up so much of the country's defense, uh, so much of the country's expenditure, its budget, they still are not able to protect themselves and, pr and protect the country. You know, when it comes to civilians, they can always say, yeah, well, this is, you know, foreign agencies and they can, they can spread the blame for a terrorist attacks that hit civilians. They can blame politicians. They can blame the incompetent police, the civilian police of Pakistan. But an attack against the army itself or its interests, its um, equipment, its aircraft, this would really hurt them. And I think that this is where we, would, we should concentrate our energy. Also, there's another point uh, that attacks on security forces generally are treated with a greater degree of ambivalence internationally. Attacks on civilians are universally condemned. In India, we can already take some um, solace from the fact that multiple foreign governments have condemned this attack in Pulwama as a terrorist attack. They've been quite unambiguous about that point. The Pulwama attack, okay. Mm -hmm. So what about the danger of escalation? If we are striking, say, uh, Pakistani, uh, military camp, perhaps, or uh, perhaps one of their air bases. You know, uh, isn't that isn't there a risk of escalation here? It's uh, it's more a matter of there is a, of course the risk of escalation, but I think that is not really the key issue. I think the key issue is would we succeed in linking that strike to Jaish Mohammed and to the attack in Pulwama, or would this just would this just be seen as India hitting out at a state sponsor of terror, which is what Pakistan is. Um, it's also a matter of showing operational sophistication by going for, if not the exact people, then at least the exact organization, the exact logistical nodes that were involved in, uh, in this attack. Um, to merely strike a target of opportunity, I mean, there would be nothing, for instance, Pakistan has a long frontier with us. There's nothing stopping us from hitting them anywhere along the length of that frontier, along the length of the international border. Yeah. But does it serve India's strategic objectives? Now, this question I, I cannot answer. And obviously, the professionals in the government, in the Indian government, will be considering this very seriously. I would just suggest that an attack on a military base could could serve a strategic purpose, but it could also be seen as essentially emboldening, um, essentially sort of widening the front. Whereas if we keep it narrow and contained to some targets which are legitimate and uh, acceptable for retribution, for reprisals, for preemptive self-defense, if you like, we would have a much stronger case and we can continue then with our consistent policy of exposing Pakistan as a state sponsor of terror. So what kind of a target are you thinking of when you when you say, uh, you know, um, what's the kind of target that uh, that you're speaking of? It depends on whether we wish to we wish to strike overtly or covertly. I, I have, for instance, spoken to people in the Indian government quite extensively on this matter of what targets we could hit. And one thing has come out very clearly in my conversations with them that it is not like we lack the operational capacity to do this. We do have it. I mean, that's just a fact. The question is that if we do something covertly, then the Indian public will not ever get to hear of it. Yeah. And so the public anger, which is which has built up, which built up after Mumbai and after this latest attack, that doesn't really get assuaged. 
Now you do something and you claim it, then you need to construct a whole different, you need to actually construct a narrative explaining the, the choice of target and the reason for the timing of, of the preemptive attack, because it will be self-defense. We would, we would strike only to prevent another attack on ourselves, and that is accepted as legitimate um, internationally. So if we were to covertly hit terrorist groups in Pakistan, I don't think there is a shortage of logistical personnel that can be dealt with in a very uh, aggressive ways. It's a matter of just choosing the time and place. And of course, the professionals in Delhi will be, will be thinking along these lines. If you want to do something overtly, then it may have to be confined to, for instance, POK, Pakistan Occupied Kashmir. Uh, unless, of course, the Pakistanis are stupid enough to try and then launch another attack somewhere in the in the Indian heartland, for instance, like Mumbai, or which it did, then there is no real reason for us to limit ourselves to POK. If if Pakistan strikes say, the Indian hinterland through a terrorist group, then we can attack anywhere ac across the Pakistani hinterland as well, and uh, this could be an overt or covert strike. Make makes no difference. But when uh, they've carried out a terror strike in JNK, it might make sense to either covertly hit Pakistani jihadist groups and military installations across the length and breadth of Pakistan, wherever we seek an opportunity or we find an opportunity. Um, and if we want to do it overtly, then it's better to limit it to POK and highlight the fact that after all, POK is disputed territory. Pakistan mm -hmm. is occupying it illegally. Um, they haven't vacated it as they were supposed to. They talk about UN resolutions, which they themselves have done nothing whatsoever to observe. So, and furthermore, they're in breach of other UN resolutions, such as uh, not allowing their territory to be used for terrorism. So, it, it really depends on whether we want to retaliate overtly or covertly. Uh, let's just move away from these uh, fireworks and let's look at uh, consistent uh, criticism, uh, which is voiced in the media here in India that India lacks a strategy to deal with uh, Pak-sponsored terror. You know, in all these years, we haven't been able to get our act together on how to deal with this. Do you agree with this? I think what we what we have lacked is a coherent counter-proxy war doctrine of the kind that Mr. B. Raman, the late B. Raman, had advocated. One which makes, which doesn't flip-flop which doesn't go between saying Pakistan, a strong and stable Pakistan is in our interest, which doesn't create completely unsustainable and fake atmospherics of goodwill through dialogue, through, uh, for instance, you know, bottom up movements that advocate uh, some sort of civil engagement, people to people contact and so on. We are dealing with a rogue deep state and that deep state has been remarkably consistent. We have only been good at at loss prevention, but we have not been good at degrading the offensive capacity of that deep state. And I think that is really where we have lacked a strategy. And uh, do you see that earlier under the current government uh, in the last few years, there's been a more, um, there's been an effort to try and finesse that? I think there has been a greater, a greater clarity about the fact that Pakistan is a hostile country. We are not, for instance, uh, we're, we're not letting them off the hook the way we used to in the past, for instance. One, one thing that I've always noticed is that when it comes to, say, an international conference or uh, any kind of exchange between Indians and Pakistanis at uh, track 1.5, track 2 level, there's always a lot of artificial bonhomie, especially from the Pakistani side, essentially to impress Western observers and to make them feel that, uh, you know, eventually we... The Indians don't really have to use grievance against us. Otherwise, why would they shake our hands? Why would they, for instance, uh, be seen with us? Uh, mm -hmm. And I think what has what has been different under the present government is that we've been remarkably forthright about the fact that yes, we do consider Pakistan as a, a, a problematic country, as one which is sponsoring terrorism as a matter of policy. This is not the work of non-state actors. This is a very consistent policy of their government. It will not change just because they're talking about now Pakistan and the rest of it. Uh, I think that is different and that is to be welcomed, actually. Now, whether that will yield strategic results is a different matter, but you know, the mere fact that we are not in this completely in incongruous situation where we offer them 
most favored nation status and they never bother to reciprocate, although they're obliged to. I think yeah. those kinds of uh, ambiguities are gone and that is to be welcomed. Okay, so I come to my last question. Whether uh, you see anything in Pakistan that would suggest, um, uh, you know, a desire to change, you know, um, because I was just reading some article uh, the uh, little while ago, which said that the current uh, younger generation of Pakistani military officers don't see India as a threat. You know, they rank domestic terrorism much higher. So it holds out the, um, you know, kind of. Uh, uh, sense that perhaps uh, you may have a new generation of guys who say, well, okay, India is not a threat. Uh, you know, things could change. You see anything out there right now? Yeah, well, I, 10 years ago, I, I could have seen something similar. Uh, you know, there was a Pakistani senator who, who in 2008, very grandly declared to an Indian audience, of course, that um, we don't see India as our number one threat. Uh, now it's uh, the Americans. We are far more anti-Americanism is much greater in Pakistan than anti-Indianism. Uh, then the Pakistanis every now and again keep saying, oh, you know, this latest election, India was not anywhere in the in the picture. Okay. No one was in, engaged in India bashing. So we hear this kind of uh, this kind of periodic recycling of old lies all, all the time. Now, an American diplomat once said something very interesting to me. And this was in 2010, so it was before Abbottabad. He said the Pak. He was talking about the growing uh, state of the growing rupture in U.S.-Pakistan relations and how the Pakistanis essentially keep circulating or rather recirculating the old lies uh, over and over again to every visiting American delegation. He said the Pakistanis don't understand. We have an institutional memory, and we keep files and records of what they tell us, and we pass those on when we take over when we hand over to six you know our successors so mm. people know what pakistan is and european governments and the us also have an i've heard an information sharing system where they are actually comparing what the pakistanis are telling each one of them in order to eliminate this kind of potential for some sort of divide and conquer or, you know disunite uh, strategy so i think that whatever pakistan is saying now that it has changed or that there is any potential to a lot of this is is simply to be taken with a pinch of salt. Hey Mahadevan, thank you very much for uh, your views. Uh, interesting to listen to them, and um, we'll be in touch.